for they shall see God. Wow. Wow. Blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How many want to see him? And I want to see him. Okay. The only way we can see God is not through the natural eye because we can't see a spirit. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus Christ became a man. Because he was with God and he was God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen, if you're looking at me, you see the characteristics of my father. So if you read about Jesus and you read in the New Testament and the Gospels of Jesus in his life, you'll see how God is. You'll see God's character. You'll see God's justice. You'll see God's mercy. You'll see God's forgiveness. You'll see God's love. You'll see God's restoration. All of those things are in the Gospels. But he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. What does that word pure mean? It means to be purified by fire. You know, when they melt down metals and gold and so forth, they have to have a very, very hot tempered uh, temperature in order to melt that, that metal to make it pliable so that it can be fashioned into different things. Uh, you may have a ring, a gold ring, you may have a gold necklace, you may have a gold earrings, but they didn't just come that way. They, that gold had to be melted, gone through a process, and brought into a mold. And then that mold is what formed your jewelry. In the same way, God has to put us through a process in our hearts to melt away or to do away with those things that are not pleasing to him. But there's a problem with mankind. And I've heard this many times, especially women, when it comes to seeking a mate. Oh, it's in my heart. It's in my heart. And I say, well, get it out of there. <laughs> you know, it's in my heart, you know. I really feel in my heart I need to. Well, let's look at what God's word says about our heart. We're going to go to my slides there for a moment. There's some points that I want to bring up to you today. In Jeremiah 17.9, God talks about the heart and he says, the heart is wonderful. It's beautiful. You can trust it. What does it say? It says, the heart is deceitful. What is deception? What does deception mean? What does it mean to be, dis to be deceived? It means that it, it will give you one thing when it actually is going to, uh, there's another purpose that's going to be fulfilled. It'll speak to you one thing, but... There's another purpose involved. The heart is deceitful. Say it with me. The heart is deceitful. Now you understand it's not talking about the fleshly thing that pumps your blood. It's talking about your spirit, your soul. It's deceitful above all things. Say it with me, all things. It's deceitful above all things. And desperately, desperately wicked. 
Say, that's not my heart. Yes, it is. Without God, that's what your heart is. Your heart's desperately wicked. It's deceitful. It will cause you to make the wrong decisions and go into the wrong choices in life. Why is that? Well, it's for the reason that if we go back into Genesis chapter 3 for a moment, we're going to leave that slide for a moment. We're going to go back into Genesis chapter 3. Deals with the fall of man. Now understand, before this time, man was created in the image of God. Man was created without sin. They were perfect. I want you to think about that for a moment. That before that fall, man was perfect in all of, their, in all of his ways, in his thinking, in his spirit. He was innocent. And then the Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I saw something very interesting here. And the woman said to the serpent, Now here's the problem. Here's the problem. Eve is perfect without sin. Right? And now she is trying to converse with the Satan. I will tell you, you will lose every single time. You'll never win an argument against him. It's only when you come to him in the name of Jesus Christ, when you come in the authority of Jesus Christ, you can have the victory over him. So the woman comes to Eve and says, notice he didn't go to the man. See, I believe when God spoke to Adam and he said, you can eat of all the trees, that was before Eve was formed. And he said, you can, and he named all the animals, he named everything. That was before Eve came. And he said, and God told Adam, you can eat of every tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you not to eat of it. For in the day that you eat it, you're going to die. So God told that to Adam. When Eve came along, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God had a direct communication with Eve. In fact, God didn't have a direct conversation with Eve until the fall. So I believe that Adam was the one that instructed his wife and told her, gave her the whole outline of what God spoke to him. It's called divine authority, which is a word that people today do not like. You need to respect divine authority in headship. The Bible says God is the head of man, man is the head of woman. Hello, that's the way God instilled it. And you can shake your heads all you want to. Those are watching by Facebook, you can shake your heads all you want to. Now, I'm not talking about a tyrant. I'm not talking about someone who misabuses his authority. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a godly man who you uh, marry to and, and you sit under and you can trust the decisions that they've made. And here Eve is having this conversation with the devil. And it says, The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That was one of her problems. She added to the word of God. Nowhere did God tell Adam not to touch it. He said not to eat it. You got that? 
God never told Adam, lest you touch it. He said, if you eat it, you'll die. Eve comes along, adds to that word, and says, no, if we, if we, if we eat it or touch it, this is very important. You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. So her thinking was, if I eat it, I'm going to die. If I touch it, I'm going to die. Either or. One of the two. I've often wondered about that scripture. Why did Adam, after Eve gave him that fruit, why did Adam eat it? Understand now, he was perfect. There was no sinful nature. I mean, the sinful nature was not, in, was not initiated yet. That nature had not fallen yet. So why did Adam eat of that fruit? And I was thinking about that. I said, God, there's got to be a reason. He had his eyes wide open. He, you spoke to him. He had a relationship with you. He walked with you and, you, and God walked with him in the Garden of Eden. He named all the animals and everything that was to be named was named by Adam. He had a relationship with God. Why would he eat that fruit? Having his eyes wide open. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, because he believed the lie. And I said, what do you mean he believed the lie? The next verse says, when the, uh, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit, therefore did eat it, and gave it to her husband. And he did eat. And I believe the Lord spoke to my heart and said, the reason why Adam did it was because he believed the lie that Eve said that if you eat it or touch it. He took it in his hand. And he said, well, it must be over now. I, I touched it. And so he ate it. That's the only reason I could, that I felt the Lord was telling me. That he believed the lie of his wife. That she said, lest you touch it and die. Because it says that the, the husband was with her in this confrontation with the devil, with the serpent. So he was right there listening to the conversation. And from that moment on, when they partook of that fruit, the sinful nature kicked in. Our spiritual communication with God was cut off. And now man was, had an emptiness to their soul, trying to seek fulfillment of that emptiness. Go back to my slides. The heart is regarded as the seat of physical life. It denotes the center of all physical and spiritual life. It is part of the soul or mind. It is the fountain and seat of the thoughts and passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. It is of the middle or central or innermost part of anything that is developed. It comes from the heart. Back to my slide number two. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. 
It would be a terrible thing if God left man in that condition. A heart that was deprived, sinful, wicked above all things, desperately wicked, deceitful. But God made a promise to the children of Israel, and he makes a promise to you and I. He says, I will, say I will. It's God's will to give them a heart to know me. God wants to give you that heart, but you have to be open to receive that heart. You have to want that heart. God doesn't fix your heart. He says, for I am the Lord thy God and will be with my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with their whole heart. So the operation, if you will, that God wants to do on each and every one of us. And by the way, my brother-in-law is doing a lot better now. He had open heart surgery. He had to take his heart out again, out of his body. Replace the valve, put it back in. But God wants to do a spiritual surgery. And he has done that with you and I when we're born again. He gives us that heart to know him. And so that we can serve him with our whole heart. Not half-hearted, but with our whole heart. Because now we have a new heart. We have a new spirit. Old things are passed away. All things become new. God is developing something in us. And that's the desire to know him and to be known. He wants us to seek him with the whole heart. But something has to take place. You know, a surgeon or a doctor cannot touch you without your permission. You have to give consent. You have to fill out a consent form. You have to sign it so that they can do this procedure on you. In the same way, God needs your permission, your consent. To help give you, if you don't have one already, to give you a new heart so that you can serve him with your whole heart and not half-heartedly. But it's going to take a spiritual surgery. A spiritual operation needs to take place because there's some defectiveness or deceitfulness in that old heart of yours. In that old spirit of yours. The old heart, the old spirit is a spirit of rebellion. It is a refusal to place oneself under authority. That old heart wants to do what it wants to do. It wants to go where it wants to go. It wants to serve who it wants to serve. God says, a surgery is needed in order to make things right. Why? Over time, from the Garden of Eden, Over time, little by little, as sin began to increase, and sin began to increase, and the heart became more wicked and more wicked and more wicked and more against God, more against his word, more against uh, righteousness, more against holiness, but more toward fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It got further away, and the heart becomes hard. You say, how does that happen? 
through unforgiveness. You know, your heart can become so hard through unforgiveness that you're not willing to forgive. And it can actually have physical manifestations in your life. I believe that that's some of the problem to some of the people that I've spoken to that have unforgiveness in their life. They won't forgive and they're having all kinds of bodily functional problems because of unforgiveness. And it's because of a hard heart. There are some people that have hard hearts. They have a hard heart. What is a hard heart? A hard heart is not, I'm not talking about the, the flesh now, the fleshly heart that pumps. I'm talking about the inner man, that spiritual man is hard. It's not going to relinquish control. It's not going to give up control. It wants to be in control of their every thought and life. But it's hard. You can take a sponge all day and throw it against the window and it won't break. Because it's soft. It's pliable. But you take a rock and you throw it out a window and it will smash. Or it will crack. Or it will dent, depending on how hard the object is thrown. So God knows that the heart of mankind, through years and years and years, I see that it's going way up on temp temperature 75. We don't want that. No surrey Bobby. And we know that God doesn't want us to have a hard heart. And it saddens me that so many people suffer physically, mentally, because of unforgiveness. Can I tell you, way before, way before doctors were diagnosing people with all kinds of personality disorders, I believe it's because of unforgiveness. Now, God has you on the operating table to do what? Next verse. Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, moreover, I will give you a new heart. And when you get this new heart, this new inner man, where your spirit man and Christ's spirit are joined together in your, in your body. He said, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to put a new, what? Spirit. God doesn't want to hear I can't. God doesn't want to hear, well, that's the way I am. No. You have no excuse because God's given you a new heart and a new spirit. You can use those excuses all you want to, to stubbornly say, I'm not going to change. I don't want to change. I am not going to. But God says, no. If you belong to him, what was my opening scripture? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But you need to go through this operation. You need to go through this surgery. You need to go through this time. And it's not going to be pleasant. I'm sure my brother-in-law did not want to go through another surgery. He was in surgery for eight hours. Because there was a problem with the surgery he had the first time.
They cut him from here down to here. They opened up his chest. They took his heart out of his body as they use a machine to keep his blood pumping, keep oxygen going to his brain. Repaired the valve on the heart, then took the heart, put it back inside the body. That's painful. When you wake up from an operation like that and a surgery like that, you're in pain because they have to crack your ribs. You know, when you hurt one or two ribs, how it hurts? Can you imagine cracking all your ribs and spreading it out so they can get to the heart? Sometimes it's going to be very painful. But God says, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to put a new spirit within you. But before he can do that, before he can add something, he has to subtract something. He says, and I will remove the heart of stone. When I was in uh, Louisiana, they were having an altar time of worship and praise, and I was standing in the front row, and this woman, near they, they waved the flags. I'm not a flag waver, don't like wa waving flags, but that's me. But that's what they do, they wave flags. I had to back up a few, few, <laughs> a few steps, because I thought I was gonna get knocked on the, he on the head. But all of a sudden, this flag waver, her husband, comes to the altar and just knelt down and was praying and was crying out to God. And God said, go give him a word that I want you to tell him. So when he was standing up there and praising God, I walked over to him and I said, can I tell you something? I said, you may not understand fully what's going on, why you're weeping or why you're crying, but God showed me that he's giving you a new, he's giving, he's giving you a tenderness to your heart that you haven't had for a long time. And he just began to weep and I walked away and left. She, uh, she messaged me and saying, Pastor, you were right on the money. God was doing something with my husband, changing that hard stone personality and heart that he had. God is melting that heart. Uh, that's their terminology. I say God is taking over and putting a new heart and a new spirit within you. A spirit where when God gives you that new spirit and new heart, it's not an effort to come to church. It's not an effort to read your Bible because you have a new spirit. But when you are, you are leaning on the old spirit or still hanging on to that old spirit or that old heart, you're going to struggle. But I found that as you begin to even listen to the word, getting that word in you every single day, you get stronger. Understand this. Taking these steroids, I, I was telling you, I can't sleep. For some reason, I can't take anything else with it. They told me not to take anything. So, but I can't go into that deep sleep. So I'm very surface. School. I can hear the truck going down the road. I can hear. Usually I don't hear any of that stuff. And I lay there for hours and hours. And I just put the word on, on the tape and put my headphones on. And I just was lay there and just, I hear chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter five, chapter 10. And that word's going in, that word's going in, the word's going in. When I woke up the next day, you know, after I did fall asleep for a short time, but like I said, in that light sleep, I was refreshed. I woke up and I said, I see things clearer. I feel stronger than when I go into that deep sleep. I said, God, what is it? And he said, it's my word. It's my word. Get the word in you. He said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart 
of stone. Stones hard. That stubborn, I will not. I will not. Can I tell you, a lot of times people react or they act out of hurt and pain. And it's the only way that they know how they can control things, control situations, control people. Is they pull out all the stops from the past. They tell people, you're no good. You did this, you did that, you did this, you do that. Because they want to be in control. Can I tell you, you need a new heart. You need a new spirit within you. You need to go through the process of having this surgery so that God can take out that heart of stone, that unwillingness to bend, that unwillingness to, to be uh, conformed into the image of Christ. Do you know that some women... They won't come out and say this publicly, but they said, I wish my husbands would be more tender toward me, more loving to me, instead of sharp. You know where that comes from? A hard heart. A hard heart. When the husband gives orders to their wife rather than requests, it's a hard heart. I'll tell you, Linda will do anything for me. And I don't have to order her or demand. But she does it out of respect because I love her. God will change your heart. Remove that heart of stone, hardness. Because without that, you won't have a pure heart. And you won't see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that means cursed is the one who will not allow that heart to be pured, for they will not see God. You can come along with all your fancy Christian jargon and your knowledge, but if you don't go through this process, you are not going to see God. Because all you become is a religious Pharisee. All you become is a religious person. Just come to church, but go home and do whatever you want to do. Go wherever you want to go. You don't ask the Lord, should I go into that place? Should I watch that R-rated movie? Should I be watching more of television and less on your word? But yet no time for God's word. We can sit there and watch five, six, seven hours of television. You think that's going to uphold with God? You think God wants to be second? Or he'll take your leftovers? He's not a leftover God. He wants 100% or nothing. 100%. Think if you had a husband or a wife and all she gave you was 50%. My question is, where's the other 50 going? They say, Mar well, marriage is 50-50. No, it's not. It's 100-100. Because if you don't have the other 50, where's it going? It's going somewhere else. You need a heart transformation. You need a heart surgical removal of that stony heart. And let God remove it. You can't remove it yourself. That's like you being on the operating table and taking all the instruments and cutting yourself open, trying to do it yourself with mirrors. You can't do it. Just like if you had to have natural heart surgery, you have to have a doctor, you have to have a surgeon do it on you and do it to you. It's the same way spiritually. You can't do it on your own through good works. 
The only way you can do it is by saying, God, come and cleanse my heart. How can you tell if a person has had surgery? How can you tell? You can tell by how they speak. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, sometimes when we have the surgery, that's good. But then sometimes there's complications. There's complications. And sometimes the surgeon needs to go back in. Right? And there's an area here or an area there or a little area here, a little area there. And the surgeon says, well, I got to go back in because I got to clean some things up. And sometimes by the neglect of the surgeon, he has to go in and get his pair of scissors that he left in there. But God's not like that. God doesn't leave anything behind. And maybe five or ten years down the road, just like my brother-in-law had to have another surgery, sometimes we need to say to God, God, you know, I've let things slip over the years. I've been serving you 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. But God, there's some areas of my life that there's been some hardening of the arteries. And now I need to, I don't maybe not need a, a whole new heart, but I need some new arteries. I need some, some new things to be put in me that I've allowed to corrupt me. I need to have new arteries put in. My next verse, please. How does this come into being? It comes through asking. All the words that have to do with God, I put in blue. All the words in red is to do with the blood of Jesus. Is crying out to God and saying, create. Only God can create that in you. Oh, you can put up a bunch of standards and have a religion and, you know, just act it out. It's, it's like, it's like you having a friend. There's a difference between a friend and a, an acquaintance. A friend will lay down his life for you. An acquaintance, when there's trouble, he'll be running 50 yards ahead of you to get away from the trouble. But a true friend sticketh closer than a brother. A friend will stay there right by your side, willing to take the heat with you. That's how you know if you have a friend. Can I tell you, before I was a Christian, before I was a pastor, and I was in the world... And I was in the nightclub business, and I'd hang around the nightclubs, and I'd make friends. Let me tell you, they will be your friends as long as you have money. They will be your friends as long as you buy a couple of rounds now and then. They'll be your friends. But when something happens, they're nowhere to be found. My father was a member of a club in New Bedford for almost 40 years. He served on that. Whenever they had dinners, he'd go and volunteer his time. When he'd, he'd do the bartending or whatever he needed to do to help that organization. And when he died, not one single person from there came to his funeral. Yet they were all his friends. No, they weren't his friends. They were his acquaintance. Create. God is the only one that can create a new heart. God is the only one that can take that stony heart out and give you a pliable heart a soft heart that will listen. Hot hearts don't listen. 
They can't because their hearts are hard. And it goes like this. Nobody's going to tell me. Nobody's going to do this. Nobody's going to do that. I won't let. That's a hard heart. To be open to God, to say, God, here I am, laying on the table of surgery. If you've, anyone's had surgery, you know how it goes. You're on that table. You're on that operating table, getting prepped. Many times you probably prayed on that table. But on the spiritual table, create God. Create. Create. God, do it. Create in me a clean heart. And renew. Say renew. A steadfast spirit in me. But God has to move some things around. When I got saved, it was nice before I got saved being in the nightclubs because, you know, I played and stuff like that. And people would compliment me and, you know, oh, you're a great musician, you know, Bob, you know, and blah, 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 blah. It felt good, you know. It felt good to get that. Accolades and stuff, you know, felt good. But I remember when I got saved, God said, it's time to go. God wants to take away so he can add. He will not take away the stony heart and add to you a new heart until you're willing to let go of certain things. And the moment you do, not only does he give you a new heart, but he gives you a new spirit in you and touches you where you want to do what's right. You don't want to do what's wrong. You want to go in the right direction. You don't want to go in the wrong direction. And all of a sudden, what would happen, and I'll tell you what happened with me. Joe, and I, Joe was my best friend growing up through fourth grade all the way up. My best friend. And when I got saved, when I received that new heart, when I got that new spirit within me, God says, you cannot hang around with him any longer. Because he will influence you. You were too buddy-buddy. You were drinking partners. You were dope partners. You were doing all that kind of stuff. And he'll only bring you back. Don't you think for one moment you'll influence them. They'll influence you. And so we went our separate ways for many years. Hadn't seen him sometimes 10 years. Then only toward the last 10, 15 years, God started putting it on my heart to get in touch with him. And I did and go over to Boston once a year for lunch. And we'd have lunch and we'd talk. And, you know, you're still seeing where I was, what I was doing. And after all these years, now he comes. His sister comes. But it took something hard to leave my friend that I used to hang around with. We were buddies, played army in the dirt as a kid and all that stuff. Ran around, hooting and hollering. And it took a new heart and a new spirit. 
But I wanted God more than I wanted my friend Joe. There was nothing that I did not want more than God at that time. I left my job. I left my car. I sold my brand new car. Remember that Fiat I used to have? I sold it. Because I didn't want to go back into that business ever again. And a few years later, there was still some clogged arteries God had to get out of me. I backslid a little bit. And God had to put me back on the table. And I'll never forget that day. I'll tell you this right now. I went, I went back into the drugs and the alcohol and the nightclubbing and all that when I was living in Virginia and Pennsylvania. And I went back there and I came to New Bedford and I went back into the nightclub business, you know. And I did all of that stuff, but I was miserable. Did you know why? Because I had a new heart and it was starting to fail. And so the guilt and the condemnation was terrible. And I remember one night I was living with this girl at the time. She came home and she said, you know, I've noticed something the last few weeks. What's wrong with you? Now listen to me what I'm telling you. This is the truth. I met her in Pennsylvania. She said, what's wrong with you? Something's wrong with you. I said, it's my heart. My heart's not right with God. And she said, well, why don't you get right with God? Hear me now. Hear what I'm telling you. She said, why don't you just get right with God? And this is what I said to her. I said, I can't get right with God as long as we're living together because it's sin. It's wrong. Within a week, she was packed up and moved out. I didn't have to tell her a thing. God did it. My heart was broken. Hear me now. Let me tell you, I know I've been there. And I was in my apartment. I remember... Devastated, I came home and she was gone with a note. And I got on that floor. I was weeping and I was crying. Boy, it don't sound very macho, Pastor. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you, when you're all by yourself, ain't nobody looking at you. But God sees you. I cried out to God. I said, God, I said, I can't take it anymore. I can't take the living in between. Good and bad. I can't live. I can't live like this. I know what's right. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I can't live in the middle. I can't be lukewarm. God, either take me back or let me go. Those are my words. God, take me back or let me go. Well, I guess you know what he did. And I've been free ever since. Because I allowed God on that spiritual operation table to cut out the things in me that didn't belong there anymore. Create in me, not just a good heart, but a clean heart. And renew a steadfast spirit in me. And the end result will be, through that process, there's going to be pain, let me tell you. There's going to be some pain. There's going to be some kind of sacrifice that you're going to have to do. There's going to be some loss. But in that loss, there's an addition that's coming. And that addition is God's favor. That addition is being able to 
breathe again, to walk again. You know how it, you know what, how it, how it's like if you have a bad heart. You can't walk up a flight of stairs. You're out of breath. <sighs> but when you have the surgery, you can breathe again. Come on, somebody. And the end result will be Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you want to see God? That was weak. Do you want to see God? Do you really want to see God? Can I tell you, he's a holy God. And without holiness, no man will see the Lord. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. Oh, he's holy. He's not some religious statue setting up on a, on a platform somewhere. He's not some stone article. He's real and he's alive. Hallelujah. He can't be bought. He cannot be bribed. And he cannot be fooled. And he cannot be deceived. He knows what's in your heart. He knows. We sing that song, he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. How do I know that? For he walks with me and he talks with me. Along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. But he won't live within the stony heart. He won't live in the old man. He won't live in the old heart. You've got to have that surgical procedure. It's called being born again. Can we have every head bowed, please? Even listening by Facebook Live right now. You might be listening to my voice and you say, Pastor, I need that surgery. Pastor, my heart has been hardened through situations and circumstances in life. And I need a surgical operation from God. Can I tell you, all you need to do is to bow your head and say, God, I want to see you, but the only way I can see you is if I have this heart operation where you take out this stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. God, I ask it in the name of Jesus, come into my life. Bring me that new spirit that I'm ne that's needed. Bring in that spirit that's needed in my life, God. I confess to you that I'm a sinner, that I've corrupted this heart through sin and deception and wrong choices. And God, I ask you, Lord, to give me a new spirit. Create in me a new heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me so that I can see you one day. Hallelujah. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ came and he's the surgeon. He's the one that's gifted enough to do this open heart surgery on me. Because he knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. So Jesus, come do this surgery in my heart. If that's you and you don't know Jesus, pray that prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Do that surgery that's needed. Now, maybe some of you, you've had that surgery before, but through the years, you've allowed, you've allowed some of the arteries to get clogged. Maybe made some wrong choices, wrong decisions, or just re we relinquish that control of the new man to the old man. And now the old man's back in control and it's, it's re-hardening that heart. It's causing that heart to have some, some scar tissue that needs to be cut out. 
and say, Pastor, I've held unforgiveness, resentment for my past life. I've been cruel. I've been mean with my mouth because the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you've been speaking some things that have been horrible, it's because it comes from your heart. You need to have a new heart. If that's you, I want you to come forward so we can pray with you. Don't worry about what other people think. It doesn't matter what other people think. It only matters what God thinks. You say, Pastor, I need, I need some surgery in my heart. There's some things in my heart that I haven't given over to you. And I want to do that. I'm going to take a few moments.